Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us today. Um, really happy to have you here on this session. I think we have a, an amazing panel about a very interesting topic. I think if we had known three weeks ago and we scheduled the session where we'd be today, we'd be even more surprised. So uh, clearly it's growing and evolving incredibly quickly. Uh, there's a lot of impact to us and, and our work, our companies and the, the work that we do. Uh, so hopefully uh, you're gonna come away with this with better understanding, get some good insights. We're hoping this is a useful session for you. And um, just to introduce myself, Dave Blackburn, head of digital marketing for ProShares, also a board member of Financial Narrative. and. Super happy to be here with this amazing uh, group of panelists, and I'm going to pass it over to them to, to introduce themselves. Uh, alphabetical by first name, please. So Jason, you're first. Sure. Uh, thanks, Dave. Thanks, uh, Financial Narrative. Uh, Jason Schechter, uh, Head of Communications at Bloomberg. Uh, glad to see uh, that us humans still have a, a, a role in society. Uh, this might be our last all-human panel that we're doing, so take note of it. Uh, thank you for including me. Great, Catherine. Hi, good morning, good afternoon all. It's so nice to be here with this really amazing group today. I'm Catherine Lucas. I head up platform software and technology marketing at State Street, based out of Boston. Excited to be here. Welcome, thanks, Kevin, off here to you. Hi, my name is uh, Kevin Trowbridge. I'm a software developer based in San Francisco. Um, these days I'm the CTO of Quoted, which is, um, an expert network that connects the reporters with expert sources. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here talking about open AI and uh, the generative AI models. Great, and last but not least, Lisa. Hi, Lisa Lansbury, SVP of Corporate Communications and Public Relations at Synchrony, um, based here in Stanford. In my free time, I love to learn how to code in Python and a little bit of a techie geek. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. We're going to come back to the panel in a moment, but first, a little bit of stage setting, a little bit of kickoff. Um, so th this is big, right? I think we all are realizing this is big, whether whether it came on your radar in late November when, when OpenAI launched uh, ChatGPT or whether you followed the evolutions and <laughs> sometimes missteps from some of the big players. Um, but but uh, some weeks it's headline a day, some days it's three headlines a day, um, certainly growing incredibly quickly. And we, we don't know where it's gonna be um, a, a month or, or a, a quarter from now. So we're, we're hoping to keep up uh, and uh, we'll provide some, hopefully some insight today. We have some follow-up events already planned. Um, so please stay with us today, stay with us uh, in the future. And, and we're, gonna, we're gonna continue to, to hopefully be a, a point of conversation and, and knowledge sharing and info exchange as, as we're all dealing with this. Um, so a couple of uh, just slides and thoughts to set the stage. We, we see this as um, we're hoping you're already familiar with it. So we're not gonna go too much into the, the, the guts and the basics of generative AI versus ChatGPT versus some of the other tools that are that are using these engines and these models. Uh, however, you know, if, if you're feeling lost, uh, if, if you feel like you need to catch up, I think that the, the, the roundtable session that we're gonna have on the 23rd will be a good opportunity to dive back in and, and maybe do that. In the meantime, I encourage you to, to check out the sources online. One, one that I found very useful is the AIExchange.com. Um, there's, there's a couple content creators there that are just doing a great job of, tracking things, putting the information out there in really digestible um, digestible ways. Um, but yeah, like I said up front, this is, this is a new topic. It's evolving incredibly quickly. Um, we want this to be a starting point. We want the conversations to go on. So we're gonna have some great conversation with our panelists today. Uh, you can submit questions to the, um, to the Q&A screen on Zoom, please do that. We've, we've got some ideas already, but we'll be happy to, to make it interactive by taking your questions. Um, just a little bit of the background. I mean, I think a lot of this came on people's radar last November uh, when ChatGPT beta launched. But I don't know how many of you were using narrative science in 2010, right? That, that was a company that, that founded 
founded in 2010, became Quill, got acquired by Salesforce, et cetera. That, that was AI writing, it's not quite press releases, not quite news articles, but you know, blurbs based on data that got input to it. And it was just churning out the content uh, in an automated way. It was AI, it wasn't nearly, wasn't nearly on the scale or the, the capabilities of what we have today, but um, it, 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 it's been out there. What, what we have now is this, this new um, generation of large language models of which um, GPT-3 is the big gorilla, although just an announcement today that another one of the big players is, is launching their own um, large language model, which will be powering a whole new set of tools, uh, et cetera. So like I say, we're evolving. It's, uh, it's, it's going very quickly. And uh, we all just have to keep up because I think there are profound implications for, for what we do and, and, and how, we, how we do our jobs, how we work with our companies and our partners. Um, and just a little bit of a thought starter. So, you know, how could we, as, as, as marketing communications professionals for financial services, um, as, as we work in our own jobs, as we work with our agencies and partners, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, just a few thought starters. If you haven't got into this, I think this is a really interesting uh, series of uh, ideas across the life cycle of content and the creative process. Where can generative AI step in and play a role? I, we're not going to go into this. This is this is just for for demonstration of hey, there's a lot of potential out there. And I think the interesting thing, if you go looking, is there there are tools that do all of these pieces already. They're using um, GPT three as an engine uh, with their app or their interface on top of it, and all this stuff is is available out there. So tons of interesting stuff. Um, that's kind of the, the the ground setting. Enough from me. Uh, let's let's move on to our panel, right? So um, picking up kind of from that from that workflow or the idea of how it's how it's going to um, impact what we do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in terms of our jobs, really the question, how, how do you see the role of marketers and corporate communications people um, evolving in this new age of generative AI? How's it going to, how's it going to change what our people do, what our people don't do, and, and how we make it all work together. Um, I'd like to throw it out to, to Catherine first, uh, just to hear your hear your thoughts. Yeah, no, thanks. I, I think, you know, for me, when I think about this, the key thing that I keep telling myself is that the result is human-like responses, right, that are, that are generated. But just like us as fallible human beings, the bot can be wrong. And I think while there's no doubt in my mind that the technology is, is just so interesting uh, for those of us who like to nerd out on these kinds of things, there's, it's so revolutionary and it's so un unprecedented. What I keep telling myself and, and talking to my team about is there's, there's just really no doubt in my mind that it still needs those human checks and balances for use in marketing and for everyday life. I, you know, by no means see this as a replacement for anything or anyone, but rather as a potential enhancement or augmentation to our broader marketing department and our broader suite of tools. I think, of course, there's, you know, there's this communication element, which of course is, is you know, a group of communications experts, I'm sure we're going to, to dig into more, but I also look at the opportunity for creating visuals and imagery at scale with generative AI, and I think there's just, you know, a, a number of different interesting opportunities that from my from my perspective, you know, is, is just another way to engage with clients at scale. And I think, you know, just the fact that we're having forums like this, it, uh, you know, I was, I was talking to my husband about what I was doing today and, and he just, he thought it was, you know, kind of different, kind of interesting. And I think that the fact that we're sitting here consciously talking about this tells me that we've shifted from what was perhaps, you know, warranted skepticism to really um, cautious curiosity, maybe we'll, we'll say, but really intentional curiosity. And, you know, David, what, what you said is, is so important and, you know, I'll, I'll pass it back to you after this, like, I think it's so important. We all have to just keep up and we have to be, you know, a proactive and constant learner. And it's just something I can't stress enough. And luckily we've got groups like Financial Narrative that really provide that opportunity and provide those resources. Cause I think that's going to be one of the most important things as we progress through some of these, these, you know, daily changes <laughs> that we're seeing. Jason, thoughts from you on this? Yes. Um, so agree with everything. Catherine said, I did, as you, as Catherine was talking, uh, uh, I typed your question into chat GPT, uh, because uh, of course we have to get uh, chat GPT's opinion on this. So this is, so I'll tell you what chat GPT said. 
tell you my answer and then you can compare it to uh, Catherine and I and decide if Catherine and I are gonna be out of jobs uh, shortly. So uh, ChatGPT is a language model, has the potential to change the role of marketers and communicators in several ways. And then nicely organized bullets, improved customer engagement. Chat GPT can be used to develop chatbots and virtual assistants that can communicate with customers in a more personalized way. Streamline customer service. Chat GPT can be used to automate customer service tasks, such as uh, answering frequently asked questions. Uh, enhance content. I won't read them all, but I'll go through quickly. Enhance content marketing. Chat GPT can be used to generate high quality content, such as blog posts, social media updates, and product descriptions. Improve data analysis. ChatGPT can be used to analyze customer data, improve media relations. ChatGPT can be used to monitor media coverage and analyze sentiment, uh, enhance crisis communication. ChatGPT can be used to develop uh, automated crisis plans. Uh, there's a couple more bullets about streamlined stakeholder communication. And then it ends by saying uh, overall, uh, ChatGPT has the potential to enhance the effectiveness and efficiency of marketing and communications efforts allowing marketing and communications professionals to focus on higher level tasks that require human expertise and creativity. Interesting. Um, so, I mean, look, I would, I would, uh, I'd give that maybe a, a B minus, uh, my, you know, my view is, I think it's, that was a well-written response. Uh, seems like chat GPT is taking a little bit of kind of what we already do and affiliating it with automation and efficiency and marrying those together in a very well-written way. Uh, doesn't seem to me that it really addressed some of the bigger questions uh, uh, under your question, which is which is the role that we play that I think Catherine answered very well. My answer is first, who knows? Uh, as you said, this is still very much evolving. Um, you know, uh, you know what we say now may be maybe laughable in a year. Um, it's a little bit like the uh, uh, talking about the coronavirus in March of 2020 and, and quarantining for two weeks. Uh, we didn't know how the pandem pandemic would play out uh, for the following couple of years. I think. If I had to speculate, I'd think about it uh, from kind of, uh, you know, one end of the spectrum, to the other end of the spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, thinking of it kind of like social media a decade ago, right, where, you know, I think we, we looked at the evolution of social media and said, we're all going to want to develop a certain set of skills uh, in our function to take advantage of it. I think, you know, the other end of the spectrum is that generative AI is going to completely disrupt our organizations and society and we're going to all be out of a job. Uh, I land kind of somewhere in the middle a little bit more optimistic. Uh, we're certainly in the hype phase. Uh, you know, we had a story this morning that some of you may have seen that um, uh, mentions of AI and earnings calls uh, so far this year are up 77% uh, from a year earlier. Uh, the FTC actually had to put a blog out yesterday uh, warning companies not to overhype uh, AI, uh, which was interesting. Um, there is, you know, like there's no modern precedent, I think, in terms of the pace of consumer adaption uh, of generative AI. Uh, many of you have probably seen that ChatGPT reached, I think, 100 million uh, active users in its first two months. I think that is the fastest product adoption in history. Uh, you know, uh, you've seen, I'm sure, virtually every major tech company, is, as you've talked a little bit about, come out and kind of say they're going to have uh, generative AI at the core of their functionality. Just this week, Meta, Snap, uh, um, Baidu. Uh, so I think we can safely say it will change at least the way that we consume information in some way and that will obviously have implications for us um so for example seo i think our organizations have become pretty adept at seo i think there's a real question for us of what happens when when chat gpt and chat gpt's peers become our new default search engines right what happens when our content is no longer discoverable um how do we reach our audiences um well, clearly it kind of uh the more uh you know junior levels of our organization, we're going to want to have generative AI as a core skill set, much like social media. I'm sure we will look for ways to automate functions and become more efficient. But I, I'm kind of on the other end of the spectrum, a little bit more optimistic. I, you know, I think it's going to, my, my own take is that there, the concerns around some of the inaccuracies are going to maybe slow this a little bit, uh, particularly in our sector. Um, and I also think if we go back to what our value is, uh, uh, and I'm more of a communicator than a marketer, but at least in the communications world, I think it's always been in us understanding what's unique about our organization, our cultures, our business models, and then applying that to our set of skills. And that's a very hard thing for generative AI to reproduce because by definition, it doesn't have that set of data 
um, in its language model, right? It doesn't know about the pending reorganizations uh, that we're working on or our product launches or our new hires. It doesn't, it doesn't know our cultures in the same way. So, and you know, plus I think we're in a business where humans are gonna still wanna talk to humans. So, so I say all that to say, I, I think, you know, the utopian view, I definitely buy into, I think it can help drive automation. It can help drive operational efficiency. But I also think that as long as we continue to remember the unique role we play at our organizations, um, I think by and large, we'll be, we'll be fine. Great. Thanks. Um, I want to maybe dig down one level beneath that now, you know, ro roles at the organization. Let's talk about specific skills. Um, Lisa, first to you and then, and Jason, it, you know, sure. if, you, if you think about it a little bit more, but Lisa, in, in terms of skills that we need uh, on our teams and, and what we are starting to see that the generative AI systems are able to produce, um, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think building off of what Jason was just saying is that we all need to build a culture that ve values AI's contributions and the ideation that it serves. But we'll still have a culture that reinforces this whole creativity as well. So, you know, I always tease my team, do you want to train the robots or do you want to work for the robots, right? And so I think the key skill will continuously be critical thinking. You know, we need to be up leveling um, our thoughts to have that seat at the table, um, demonstrating continuous learning, curiosity. And, you know, with some of these new tools, it is going to be those people who are curious, who know how to ask questions in different ways. Um, it will then also be, you know, job descriptions that emphasize editing and fact checking, maybe more than writing. I do think that tools like ChatGPT have really been able to create copy that is on par of what an intern or an entry level employee could build. And so now it really is about, you know, fact checking that and, and raising it up. Clear writing still is going to be so critical. And I think part of that clear writing is going to be, you know, adding in the empathy and that whole emotional intelligence um, that a bot and, and, and AI really has not been seen to do at a sophisticated level at this point. So that emotional intelligence that us as communicators and marketeers can offer, you know, combined with critical thinking, I think are going to be the top skills. But you have to have then this culture that values AI contributions. I, I, yeah. I, I'm thinking about jumping to the writing element, but let's come back to that because uh, I think that's a, an incredibly important part of it. But uh, so everybody make a little note, we're, we're coming back to writing, but Jason, uh, back to you. Yeah, no, 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 uh, very good answer, Lisa. I totally agree on the critical thinking. I kind of am thinking about it now in really kind of three buckets. So one is how do we kind of augment search and do research, right? So, and 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 I mean, uh, preface all this by saying, I think the slide that you put up is a, is, a, is a great slide and worth looking at in terms of a lot of kind of the subsets, but but stepping back and thinking about it in three buckets, I think, look, even with, I think the concerns about inaccuracies, you've probably seen some of the reports that, you know, chat GPT, I think passed uh, multiple sections of the multi-state bar exam. I think it nearly passed the US medical licensing exam. Uh, you know, and that's without specialized training. So clearly, um, you know, that that it will get better. And, and look, as long as we are, are checking our our sources, which we should be doing, I think it it, it, it certainly can be a, an effective tool for us in, in, in the research area to um, especially do research more efficiently um, and not have to kind of, uh, you know, uh, um, spend a, a lot of time on it. I think the second area that Lisa touched on totally accurately to me is uh, creativity and idea generation. You know, it's a you know, now, it, look, it's certainly a skill we look for in organizations uh, without generative AI. I think drawing on generative AI, AI to come up with kind of new, um, you know, new thinking, new ideas, uh, talking to our peers, I think is, uh, is very important. The third area is kind of the new skill set area. Um, and there's two pieces to that of that. One, I, I think one of the bigger new skills that is going to develop is going to be prompting. Um, you might have seen that... Um, Prompt, uh, prompt engineering is actually a job now. So that's, a, that's a real thing. That's basically using uh, English as a uh, as a coding language, like uh, like 
C++ or Python, uh, uh, figuring out kind of which words are going to generate the best responses. Um, I have no idea how we will ultimately measure or train for that, um, but I think that's going to be a really interesting skill for us uh, to develop. Um, uh, uh, and, and I suspect we're going to see um, more uh, um, work done on, on, on kind of training and, and, and pushing for that. The more provocative area um, that I think we need to be careful on, but that I can also see developing is I think there's going to be a lot of temptation in our broader world, not just to use it for queries um, and for traditional search, but also to feed information into it. Uh, you know, I think, you know, as we know, it's a two way street, whatever uh, we put into the kind of prompt becomes part of the data model. So, you know, um, theoretically, if I am a marketer at the gap, right, and I feed uh, information uh, about how the gap uh, is uh, a leader in fashion and retail, um, it should embed that data into its model, right? And I think that, I think there's gonna be a lot of temptation uh, in our field to, to understand that and, uh, and to find people uh, who, who might excel at that. The flip side, of course, is that that obviously comes with very big ethical questions for us um, uh, that I think we need to tackle and get a handle on and we should be talking about now. Um, um, but as you know, back to my earlier point, I think as we start to see us lose some discoverability in our content, I think there's going to be a, a, um, a push for that. And I think uh, all of us should make sure that we're, we're asking the right questions around it before we go too far. Great point. Yeah, and, and sort of the rules of the road, definitely yeah. something we're, we're gonna address later in the session. So don't go anywhere, people. Um, I'm going over to the chat a little bit. Thank you all for, for being active. Um, yeah, so, uh, Joe, you you put a link into the, the Microsoft announcement about their multimodal large language model. That's that's the, the release that I was referring to earlier. Um, question uh, that, that's a little bit of a follow up on what we're talking about right now and putting people on the spot a little bit. Uh, question from, from Jan, uh, how heavily are you all using these tools in your marketing efforts? Who, I don't know, I, I for one am not, comfortable going going on the record at this point and saying we are or we are not. Um, I mean, basically we're not, but um, where we would consider it, it's interesting. I think, I think we go back to that Chevron uh, diagram of all the places where it could play a role. Um, but I don't know. Uh, I, I also, you know, made reference to the, to the things that were happening back in the 2010s where people were clearly using it to write copy. Um, I know companies that are using it to um, generate, test and optimize subject lines for emails and, and social media posts and, and evolving it based on, based on response and engagement. So, so I, I know of people who are using this. Um, I'm just wondering if anyone else on the panel wants to jump in uh, and, and give a perspective on that, how we're using it in our current marketing or comms efforts. Yeah, I can, I can jump in. This is Lisa. Um, you know, I think that we're in a test and learn phase right now. I mean, obviously, we are still talking about a technology that with ChatGPT, at least, that is, you know, less than six months old, right? And, and so um, there is a lot to continue to learn about it. However, uh, one example that we use, similar to even how Jason just asked, you know, uh, put in a prompt of trying to answer that one question is, you know, we're writing a press release on mobile wallets. I asked ChatGPT to write the press release on mobile wallets, not specific to our company, but to see what the output would be. What was interesting is the level of um, thinking that it put around security. And I would not have, you know, framed security as high in my press release as it did in its. And it made me think, well, then maybe I'm not thinking about it in the right way, or maybe I have not asked our subject matter experts enough about this topic of security that I should be addressing it because that is going to be something then that consumers you know, or our partners are asking about. So right now for us, it's more of an ideation tool. It is a tool, you know, for us to think about, you know, new ideas to think about then, you know, what types of copy could it be um, used, you know, for as well. But, you know, it, it is more of a test and learn um, and a creative arm and a creative juices, you know, thought starter um, type of process for us at this point. Great. 
Thank you. And and gold stars to those of you in the chat who chimed in. Thank you. Um, you know, Joe, James, Benjamin, and Ashley, uh, you know, help. You can all read it too, but getting a framework, outlining the thinking, tying together two concepts, posts. We talk about that a little bit. Um, legal and compliance is again rules of the road. I think we're gonna we're gonna talk about it a little bit later. Um, but awesome. Yeah, it's 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 uh it's worth it's worth trying. It's a, it's a powerful tool. Uh, and and uh, on this, maybe on the subject of, we've all seen the releases in the past couple of days of some of the big players who are, who are banning access. Um, again, the, the, the AI exchange.com that I referenced earlier, Rachel Woods is, is one of the, the lead people there. She had a great post where she said, Hey, if, if you're not using it, I'm sure your competitors are. So let's think about that one. Um, uh, well, Kevin just went off camera, but I was gonna I was gonna ask a question to you, Kevin. I don't know. Are you, are you available? Um, oh, I'm here. I had to get rid of my cat. <laughs> okay. the, uh, we had a cat who ruined an entire event when it walked over the the producer's keyboard. Beware beware of the cats in the in the in the production room. Um, so you know, working with the the. The, the machine, working with the monster. Um, we, Jason mentioned and some others also spoke about the importance of prompting and, and connecting with it. Uh, could, you, could you go a little deeper into that, maybe go under the hood a little bit on, on how that works, you know, prompting, how the motor powers the interface, you know, how GPT-3 plugs into something like chat, GPT or any of the other tools, uh, just, yeah. just from our operational point of view. Happy to, David. Um, yeah, I mean, so this, the whole way that it works, I mean, not that, you know, I necessarily understand the entire thing, but the idea is you load in, so basically it's gone out and you've, you've loaded in essentially billions of words, you know, and then you've created this kind of probability mesh between them. So you can, you can kind of, if you just think of a twinkle, twinkle, little X. So what is the next most likely word? So the way that it works, that you know, the large language models work is by predicting the next most likely word. So if you actually start typing a question and you imagine you're reading the internet, you're reading a blog post, somebody asked that same question, right? And the blog post answered the question, right? So it's just turning it around and going ahead and generating the question based on the input. So if you think of it that way, you can see how important the prompt really is because you have on the one hand a ratio between billions of words on one side and maybe 10 words in your prompt on the other. So that's why you can see such amazing variations in the output based on the input of the, of the prompt, if that makes sense. If you ask a super basic kind of casual question, you'll get that sort of response. But if you ask a super sophisticated, very you know nuanced sort of question, you'll get that kind of response. Hopefully that's helpful. That is helpful. Um, how about uh, iterating or evolving responses and, and, and prompts around that? Can you, can you walk through that process a little bit, refining the responses? Yeah, so I mean, you can always, um, essentially as you're using it, so there's this whole idea of the, you know, you can pass a certain number of words into the model, which I think today is around 6,000 with chat GPT. And now in this next generation, they're working on a larger, so you'll be able to pass in 32,000 words, which is much larger. But that's the chunk that it's processing or the maximum amount. So like as you're having your conversation in Chad GPT um, and you go along, you see how it, it will tend to get more and more refined and it'll stop becoming interesting. You know, That's why it sort of, it makes sense to go edit previous prompts change them and let it continue again from the previous point in the conversation because essentially it's going into this model as a chunk of words and if you just keep on continuing the conversation you know ad nauseum it it tends to become you know kind of stuck yeah does that and make sense it makes great sense and and i'm going to pick up a question that just came in from jared theoretically won't ai eventually generate the most effective prompts for itself at that point, it seems editing slash polishing results will become more important than prompting. It, interesting question. I mean, I think it probably, it, it's certainly deeper into the the, the math uh, and the logic of it than, than I can speak about. But one thing that I will 
talk about is is the the concept of bias, right? I think a lot of a lot has been written about what kind of bias exists already in the tool based on the concept content it has consumed and the the, the learning process that it goes through. Uh, and is there a danger that if if a little bit of bias gets introduced to the model and then that gets picked up and and keeps getting amplified, suddenly that bias is is driving the thing off a cliff. Uh, it also interesting is that uh, I, I'm pretty sure it was OpenAI released a statement in the past couple of days saying, we're okay if you want to introduce bias into your own instance of ChatGPT, which is, you know, you have a political bent or a financial hypothesis or a model that you work under and you want all the content that comes out to work towards that bias. It doesn't. It, it sounds like it could be a negative thing. It doesn't have to be a negative thing um, if you have a point of view or a, a business strategy um, that, that you want to make sure you're you're conveying in your communications. Open AI is going to start letting you do that. Um, that that was that was a release that came out within a, in a couple of days. So so Jared, it's super interesting question. I don't think we know the answer, but those are some thoughts that I have. I don't know anyone else want to weigh in on on that one either. You know, the prompting process, the refining process, the bias issue, anything. And no is no is a fine answer. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying. I want to make sure we covered all the questions. Maybe I did. I, I I'm not sure if I've missed anything. Um, let Let's move on uh, to, to some of our other questions. Um, I spoke a little bit about limiting access. Are you all seeing that already in your organization? Do you have a feeling about it? What What's What do you think the future is of of granting or limiting access to to these tools in in the organization? I can, uh, um, I can take the first stab at that if you want. Um, I think, um, I mean, look, just speaking more for kind of the broader financial industry, obviously, I'm sure you, you've seen and, and we've written about, um, I think, you know, kind of some of the larger um, uh, financial services firms blocking blocking access um, or limiting access. What I what it seems like that is based on, is, as far as we can tell, is really uh, two things, both of which make sense. One is obviously just confidential information, right? And the idea that, that uh, um, I mean, obviously firms, financial firms are highly regulated, uh, have very, uh, you know, strict uh, um, compliance uh, regimes and the, you know, and having a, a, a um, exfiltration of, of, of data is obviously a concern um, to any organization. And I think that's one thing that's driving. I think the second thing, based on what I've seen and what I've heard, is just goes back to how new this is. And you know, most organizations have a process um, for you know that has gone back years and years and years about how third-party tools are approved within an organization and implemented within an organization. Uh, and I think um, you know this is no different, right? It's a it's a it's a it's a it's a tool. It's a new tool. And my sense is that what organizations are doing now is looking and saying, okay, let's step back um, and make sure uh, that we're comfortable um, um, with these tools before we move forward. What I don't think it is, is uh, these organizations in any way saying they're, they're pulling themselves back from the from generative AI itself or, or even some of the specific tools. I think it is, uh, that, that's my sense. I'm, I'm sure others may have a, a different opinion on that. Yeah, anyone wanna weigh in on that? Well, I, I think in the next year, you're going to be able to purchase, um, you know, like a license, there'll be a negotiated, um, you know, you'll be able to, you know, your come if you want to use it, your company will be able to pay and it won't be cheap. You know, you'll pay it for a license, all the legal people will come, it will be all ironed out, you know, and um, you'll be able to rely on what you pass in being kept. Um, private, but as for today, I, that's not the case, though. You know. Yeah, and Lisa, you spoke about being careful about what you're putting into it, and and let's all have our eyes open as to what's happening to that stuff that we put into it. Any further thoughts there? I yeah. don't think. Go ahead, Lisa. Sorry. I, I was going to say, you know, I think a couple things on that, which is, you know, as organizations, you also have to think about brand safety in general. So, you know, even in this chat, people were saying that they're using ChatGPT for um, social media copy, right? Um, that type of copy, you know, might then be false. And, and it might create false, 
you know, copy in general. So brand safety in general, based on then kind of some of the mass amounts of copy now that can be created by these uh, generative AI tools is going to be interesting. I, I think the other piece, you know, on copy in general is just, you know, that so that misinformation piece is one piece. You talked about, David, you know, the bias piece. There's also this copyright piece I just saw someone put here in uh, regarding Vanderbilt too, right? You know, there is a large debate around copyright issues and it has not yet been resolved in the legal system. You know, uh, what I will say is that organizations and, and colleges, I just came back from uh, going on a bunch of college tours with my daughter and two of the universities um, had, you know, stories on chat GPT on the front page of their newspaper just last week. And it was all around then the ethics um, and using chat GPT. And those universities saw it just, they saw it as plagiarism. And so just how you would, you know, when you get into a university and you sign something saying that you won't plagiarize, you won't, you know, that you're going to do things in an ethical manner, um, they felt that this tool then was plagiarism. So, you know, for now, that's why even I think, you know, we're we're using it more as this thought starter tool versus as this is going to be the copy then that we're going to copy and paste into something else. But part of that, I think, also has to do with transparency, that if you are using this tool, that you need to be transparent with it. And whether that's even our agency partners that are going to be creating byliners or press releases or what have you, what are the processes and prompts then that you put in to get then that copy? Did you use it? So just how I would you know, flag that I used Wikipedia or another source, right? Like, you know, say that I'm sourcing a Bloomberg article. To me, you know, our belief right now is that, yes, you do need to then source chat GPT as a source at this point and, and talk about then that thinking and that process, you know, that, that you used. And so I think that transparency is going to be really important as part of all of this. Excellent point. And I, I want to do a follow up on that, maybe throw this to you, Catherine, but uh, it, it, how are we working with our external partners and, and do, what do we see as the change in the relationship there, given the availability of these tools and the possibility that they're, they're using it as well? well? I think it's pretty much what Lisa just outlined, that you need to have those conversations with the agency okay. and potentially their pricing conversations that you have to have as well, because if I'm paying for a you know highly skilled in my view individual to create something and it's a generative AI bot that's creating it then a I need to know and b we we maybe should chat about our fee schedules um, but no, I, I I think it's it's a conversation that you know not only marketing has to look at but also legal has to look at right what a what does that do to your NDA? What does that do to your to your MSA? What does that do to a whole host of things that are that are now impacted downstream? I, you know, I think it's interesting. We're talking about the risks of this, and I, I actually firmly believe, and maybe I'm a little bit biased <laughs> sitting in marketing, but I'll be honest, I actually don't think the risk is going to come from marketing. I, I think we are quite used to producing content that is meant to go externally, and that is going to be heavily criticized, right? Like, think about it. I, I mean, I, I try to produce a piece of content, and it goes through so many different reviews and checks and balances. I, I think, you know, where I worry is, when does this get, you know, used to create a board presentation or an internal communication that's then, you know, kind of subsequently leaked? I think, I think we're, as marketing professionals and communications professionals, quite well prepared for this um, and, and quite, you know. Yeah, just, and just, just one skeptical. thing, one thing to build off of that, Catherine, um, mm -hmm. I think that all makes a lot of sense and totally agree with what Lisa said. I, what I hope is that our respective kind of the trade uh, organizations uh, in our field uh, uh, are really kind of thinking about this now. I think what needs to happen is there needs to be, um, you know, maybe in the communications world, this is PAGE or IPR or PRSA or financial narrative or another group, but I think there needs to be a, a concerted effort to really uh, come out for the industry and, and kind of uh, set some standards. Um, uh, there are a lot of really good examples that, that you and, and Lisa just went through um, about how to think about it, how to source it. Uh, um, but I, I think we're all kind of throwing darts at a board right now, um, and I think it, it. I think this this needs to happen at an industry level so that we can set consistent standards. Um, I think in our 
or our own organizations, I actually think this is something we can help push. This goes back to kind of the, the value of, of our roles and the roles that we can play. I mean, obviously we're not compliance experts, we're not HR experts, um, but we are reputation experts. Uh, obviously it's a reputational risk for us, for our organizations, uh, if we're not thinking proactively about the use of this content and, and, and asking and answering these questions. And I think it is a good role for us to be pushing uh, for us to have, have this conversation at our, our various uh, organizations. Great stuff, thank you. Yeah, Catherine, I, I'm really, my head's spinning a little bit about the thought of the, the, the rate sheet based based on who's doing the work. I, I really like that idea. And, and uh, I love the idea of thinking about who is gonna write that um, series of guidelines uh, for, for the industry. Uh, it's, it's sooner or later, the regulators are gonna come in, right? And, and, and do something. Uh, uh, what what we do as as representatives of brands, what we do with our agency partners or those of us who are in agency partners, um, I, I think it's it's really important to stay ahead of it, be ready because because we know that that uh, right now it's the wild west and that that's going to lead to trouble and we need to make sure that we stay out of trouble. Um, a, a question uh, coming in about you know other use cases we talked about search, we talked about content. Uh, there's a question about plagiarism too, which, you know, really interesting debate. I think, uh, at least in the context of, of the university visits, uh, what we're hearing there and, and the way Kevin described it, right? If, if, it, if all it's doing is predict, predicting the next word and just throwing the words together, on the one hand, it's not plagiarizing at all, but on the other hand, it's massively plagiarizing from everything. Uh, can't wait to see where the lawyers come out on that one. Um, but uh, would, would love to, to hear any thoughts about uh, the actual plagiarism question. Kevin. Well, I was just going to suggest alternative use cases other than... Um, oh, okay. So it's not quite the same. I mean, you know, because we are all talking about using it to generate content, but it's actually very good at other things. Um, I guess people had already mentioned search. It's also very good at at summarizing, you know, so um, these are very useful to me as a software developer, right? You know, there's ways to use it that are much safer than generating content and putting it out into the world, if that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. I think it was quite interesting, David. I think you you and I might have been talking about it a little bit on Friday is at what stage do you use it? Do you use it to create content and then there's a human that edits it? Or does the human create content and then do you use it as an editing tool? And I think that's that's another kind of conflating point when you think about the plagiarism element of this. I, I don't necessarily at this point have normally have a view on everything, but I haven't formulated a view on, on the plagiarism aspect of this yet. Um, hopefully, mercifully um, to my legal department. <laughs> um, no, but I those? think that's... That's Correct. interesting. No, it's it's yeah. just an interesting dynamic there. I'd, I'd be curious what yeah. others think about yeah, it. Yeah, it's hard when you have a technology that improvises, right, by definition. And that's really where, where this gets really interesting. I mean, I very much like what Lisa said about at least thinking of chat GPT or other generative AI as a source in and of itself that you would, that you would cite. Um, uh, I think that has a, a lot of validity to it. But it's a really, it's a, it's a really good question, right? Because it is obviously taking large amounts of, of, of data, but it is, uh, you know, constructing its own um, word by word uh, answer based on, on that data, which is not necessarily, you know, plagiarism. So, another interesting piece that just commented that just came in. Thank you, Devin, um, from LinkedIn uh, about terms of service, right? I think you can all see it in the chat, but you know, we, we, we are thinking a lot about how our terms of service and user experience change to increase transparency around the use of AI. And, and transparency is, 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 I think, what we would all strive for, uh, clarity and transparency. Um, just one more thing about the, the use cases, right? I've spoken with copywriters who love it because they say it helps me get over writer's block. And I've spoken to others who don't suffer from writer's block at all and want to do the first bit. And then as Kevin, you said, you know, trim it down, modify it to, to shape it out to, to other places. Um, more rules of the road, uh, confidentiality issues. Um, Lisa, you spoke to this a little bit. I, uh, I don't know, Jason or Catherine, if you have any, any thoughts or concerns about that right now. I think Someone also said that we're going to get to a model, I think, Kevin, where, where you'll be able to license your own instance and it'll be 
expensive and but but hopefully somewhat secure. Um, and any other any other um, depth that we could go into on that? Well, for me, I think you know, just like any other tool, your Google search history can be found, right? This search history is just the same. So if I start typing in a pattern of questions around mobile wallets and they see a bunch of people from my organization typing in content around mobile wallets, it might mean then that we are doing something to come up around mobile wallets, right? You know, you could take a pattern on the other side. Um, and, and I think that's still is what is unknown is how are they leveraging then the prompts and the input that we're putting into some of these um, generative AI tools. And so that to me is actually really where you also need to be cautious is that's why, you know, we talked about, you know, banning at some of these organizations. It is because of some of the confidentiality and what you're doing. So I, I do feel that um, right now you're seeing a lot of academics use it. I look at this almost as phase one, early days of the internet, right? Where the internet really was just, content and there was no business transactions or anything like that and it was very focused you know on on content creation overall i feel like that's the same thing here and that there have not been enough you know policies around then the end use of that transparency of what's going to be done i agree with kevin that you know i suspect that there will be licenses for organizations but again, you're still going to see anything that you put into this tool is going to end up going to somebody else, you know, overall, right? I mean, look look at what's happening, you know, today with TikTok and the government, you know, uh, tick, you know, the government asking all government employees to remove the TikTok app from their, you know, mobile phones. It's the same thing. But you know what? That doesn't mean that those government government employees aren't then going to go use it on their personal phones. They will, you know, and they could, and so could their children. That's going to be the same thing here. If it's banned, you're going to find another means to go use the tool, you know, even if you don't have access to it in one form or another. Great thought. Anyone yeah. else? Let's go ahead. Well, just, I mean, I, I agree with all that. I mean, just that, like, I mean, I think Lisa's right. It's definitely the a bit of the wild rest right now. I think until we until we figure those things out, I think the, the main thing is at least to start with our own kind of the, the policies um, that we have at our own organizations around, you know, the use of proprietary information, the use of third party services, um, uh, you know, um, all of which I'm sure for just about everybody on this call, I'm sure is, is, is very well spelled out and just making sure that whatever we do is at least consistent and, and um, compliant with what, uh, what that lays out. And then I think it goes back to the idea that we need to set some level of, of more consistent um, standards uh, and best practices across um, our industry. Great stuff. Okay, we're we're at the ten minutes to go, uh, Mark. I want to wrap up with a with a lightning round. Uh, your your choice choice of two questions, but you could do them both. Uh, one one is, you know, what are you excited about? Uh, Around ChatGPT, I want to end on on a positive note. Um, and and what do you what do you think is the evolution would or could or should be? Um, and then how do we use all this to preserve and enhance our value as communicators um, in in doing the job we do? So either you know what are you excited about? How do we how do we use this to to enhance our value? One or both. Uh, first to you, Catherine. Oh goodness. Um, so I'm I'm excited about everything. I. I think is probably the general way that I would, I would go about it. But I think I, I tend to be usually I, anyone who knows me knows I am like full of energy, super optimistic, like always just yay to life, yay to everything. But I, I have to say with this, I, I pause, I find myself pausing. I find myself kind of worrying more often than not. And I think what I would just say is think about, and, and I think Lisa touched on it earlier, but Think about how precious your brand and your brand's voice is. And I, I really believe in marketing that we are stewards of that brand. We are the first line of defense for our brand and for that voice. And if we don't take production of it very seriously 
and work to ensure that we have a consistent voice and a consistent narrative. And again, be just super precious about it. I think we really put our brand presence in the market at risk. And frankly, we fail as marketing and communications professional professionals. So I think that the continued learning is what I'm most optimistic about, but I'm underlying cautiously optimistic about the opportunities. Sure. Thanks. Kevin, on to you. What are you excited about? How do we use this to improve our value and effectiveness in what we do? You know, uh, there will be ways for it to be used by, you know, companies. That's interesting. That's exciting for everyone. There'll be licensing and so forth. Um, I think the first things that will be used for will be specialized, you know, so you're going to train it up so that, you know, you dumped a bunch of uh, medical research into it, you know, so that maybe it will be able to give better, more quick, higher quality medical advice, you know, that you can see a lot of good coming out of that for society. Um, I think in, in terms of marketing, I think there could be a lot achieved by maybe personalizing the message to individual people. You know, you could imagine this is what we offer, which is a lot. These are the individual people. What do we have to offer them? What makes sense? I could see that happening. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not that worried at the moment about it replacing full-time employee. It's going to take a little while. Also, it's very easy to break. I'm not sure if you've noticed. Try just one, one, take your hometown, a place you know really well. Ask it for detailed advice about what to go do there. You'll see it just makes things up. Yeah. You know, that, um, so yeah. yeah. Hallucination, is that, that's a word that hasn't come up yet, but it's, a, it's something you read a lot about in, in relation to these tools. It, it just makes stuff up. I saw a phrase, uh, it's, it's confidently wrong. Yeah. Confidently wrong. <laughs> exactly. But okay. that's fixable. Anyway, it's yeah. been a pleasure, you guys. Thanks. Lisa, you're up in the lightning round. What, what are you excited about? And, and how are we going to use this to, to increase our value? Yeah, I, I'm excited about the promise um, and the output, I would say, of AI's contributions uh, in our profession. I do think that there is a responsibility that all of us need to take around how we're gonna use these tools in an appropriate and authentic manner um, and in a transparent manner uh, overall. But I do think that it will advance, you know, what we do and how we do it. Um, when I think about, you know, the old age of a press release and how it's a hundred years old and you can have this AI, you know, bot writing a hundred year old document for you. I just hope that there's going to be another medium format type of content then that we're really going to be looking at um, in the future. So, so that's really what excites me. And, you know, just to reinforce to everyone that clear writing and, and critical thinking will never go away. You've got to have those skills, um, you know, of, of writing, even if this still is going to do some of that content creation um, overall. So, um, I, I'm not worried. I think, you know, I'm looking forward to training the bot, frankly. So <laughs> teaching it more. Jason, on to you. Yeah. I mean, this is just going to echo what everybody said, but I think um, look, all of our dream is to do high value work, right? And to not have to do rote work. And I think where we are able to embrace this as a way to move away from from rote work uh, and do high value work, it is it is to our interest. I mean, thinking, it's there anything about the media side and the journalism side of our house, um, for those of you who are prolific uh, terminal users, you will know that uh, we've had something called Bloomberg Automation for a very long time. Uh, that's a literal byline uh, in our uh, newsroom um, where um, you know we ingest data and we are able to then uh, have um, our own kind of uh, um, you know tools to to turn those into really clear, simple, factual news stories and earnings right uh, output or something along those lines. That, um, but at the same time we've grown the size of our newsroom every single year and we're gonna grow it again this year. And so that's the that's the hope with us, right? Is that our journalists will be able to write um, uh, high value content and be able to think thoughtfully and critically and, and analyze and not have to 
you know, sit at a, at a terminal and type in, you know, uh, earnings information or whatever the case may be. So that just goes back to, I think, the, 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 um, the broader opportunity for us um, and hopefully where this goes. Fantastic. Uh, I, I, I like the, the, the high value um, mantra it, it, and, and we're going to wrap it up here. And I'm going to say to everyone also in the chat and, and attending in the background, thank you for, for being here and your involvement. Uh, I'm going to need to go back and look through this conversation. I couldn't quite keep up with all of it as it was happening, but it's very lively. Uh, and, and so thank you all. Um, I hope it's been a high value event for everybody. I certainly uh, have enjoyed it and learned, learned a ton as well. Uh, and the conversation continues. So uh, Ashley put links into the chat. We've, we've got an event on the 23rd, which will be more of a round table. So not just we talking heads up here talking at you, but but really want to engage with everybody a lot more. Uh, and and if this is a, a theme we want to continue, uh, I think we will. From I think th this has been a, a, a an exciting event to put together from financial narrative, uh, and it's uh, I think we've gotten a great response and great enthusiasm. So thanks everybody for dialing in. Thank you so much to the panel. Uh, it's been a pleasure being up here with you. Uh, and then one last thing: if you're going to be in New York next Tuesday and you're a member of Financial Narrative, we've got an in-person breakfast, and and uh, be great to see some people uh, in the flesh. I'll be there. Uh, and the, again, the the link is in the chat. So thank you all very much. Great event. Looking forward to continuing the conversation. Take care, all.